topics and opinions expressed in the following show are solely those of the hosts and their guests and not those of W4CY Radio, its employees, or affiliates. We make no recommendations or endorsements for radio show programs, services, or products mentioned on air or on our web. No liability, explicit or implied, shall be extended to W4CY Radio or its employees or affiliates. Any questions or comments should be directed to those show hosts. Thank you for choosing W4CY Radio. Who is January Jones? She is not a young, beautiful, talented actress on Mad Men. She is not an older, gorgeous, exotic dancer from the Johnny Carson Show. She is an author, and she wrote, Thou Shall Not Wine, The Eleventh Commandment, that reached number one at Amazon.com. She is a reality TV golf personality with World High Stakes Golf televised on HDNet. She is a humorist and winologist expert. She is your featured host today on January Jones Sharing Success Stories. So sit back, relax, and get ready to laugh and listen to Ms. Jones with her eclectic roster of guests as you learn life's lessons. These stories plus sharing equals success. Welcome and remember, beware because you are entering the no-whining world of January Jones. Hello, everyone. I hope you're having a terrific day. I'm January Jones, and I'd like to welcome you to our podcast today. You know, in life, we all wear many hats, and today I'm wearing my gold glitter hat because I'm creating a new brand, Glitter Granny Gifts, and it's an affiliate marketing at Amazon. And it'll be launching next month, so I'll tell you more about it. Uh, We'll be selling books and products with more info to come. Now for my listeners, let me ask you a question. Okay, (laughs) what do you know about counterintelligence? Yeah. Probably not much, (laughs) like most of us. Tell me, have you ever met an actual counterintelligence agent? Yeah, sounds pretty interesting. Would you like to meet someone now who can tell us about his experiences as an agent? Can you imagine what it would be like for the Taliban to request a meeting with you by name? No, I cannot. (laughs) Also, would you like to hear some predictions based on his firsthand experiences regarding Ukraine and also the Russia conflict, which is on everyone's mind these days? If you can answer yes or maybe to any of these questions, then you are in the right place. And I'd like to welcome you to January Jones sharing success stories. Actually, it's senior success stories, and I think my guests may qualify. (laughs) Now it's time to rest and relax, go get some wine, get some cheese and crackers, and join us in the no wine zone. Let me tell you a little bit about my guest today. He has spent several years as a counterintelligence spy for the United States Army, traveling to many countries, including Afghanistan, Egypt, Germany, Bosnia. He is a counterintelligence spy who will speak out openly. He has about a thousand different stories (laughs) and a thousand different failures that he will share with today. These are never before heard and unfiltered accounts directly from the front line while under fire in some of the most dangerous regions of the earth. He started the nonprofit International Institute for Nonproliferation Studies, IINPS. It's my pleasure to welcome to our podcast today. Hello and welcome, Pete Turner. Hey, thank you so much. I, I love it. Thanks for having me on the show. It's uh, it's been great uh, getting a chance to talk about all these things, and so uh, oh. I just appreciate you taking okay. the time. Okay, I want you to share with our listeners where your actual success story began, 
where you were born, raised, and share with us uh, who you were your early influences. Sure. But before we do that, do I qualify for senior success? I'm 54. Am I in the club or am I uh, my little baby? Wait, you're almost there. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. I'm getting there. <laughs> and, and, and since I'm 80, you're, you're working with a real senior. So. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. And I, I, 55, so I, I guess to answer you. Mm -hmm. oh, I was going to tell you 55 is how you qualify. And uh, I'm uh, pleased to say, to share that I have four children who are officially seniors. <laughs> oh, and the great. other it was crazy. The other day we went to a movie with one of them and I went to buy the tickets because that's what mommies do. And I ordered the tickets and I said, three seniors. And it just hit me. <laughs> yeah. that my kids, my kids are now seniors. So I just, I hope, all I hope is that I don't end up in some kind of a retirement home with our daughters because <laughs> it was hard enough to raise teenagers and that I don't think I want to live with seniors. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's funny. Uh, every time I say my daughter is going to be 27 in May, I think, no, 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 that's not right. Let me think about this. Is she 22? No, she, and I know how old my daughter is, but just my, my brain won't accept it. And then <laughs> I always think like, when I was 20, about to be 21, I was like, I can't wait so I can have this freedom of going to bars and all that kind of thing. And now I'm like, oh, pretty soon I'll be able to buy a trailer in a, uh, a trailer, you know, like a trailer park uh, uh -huh. for people who are 55 and older. I'm like, I'm almost there. I'm like so excited to be able to start shopping around. <laughs> yeah, like, you've got one year to go. But I think the, I I think the uh, AARP, uh, it welcomes people once they're 50. So yeah, you can actually sneak in before that too. They'll take your, if you want to subscribe, they'll give you a uh, card and they'll let you play along. So you're right about that. I am in the AARP world. Yes, indeed. Uh, I am too. Okay. Let's go back to where were you born okay. and uh, your, let's share your early success story. Yeah. So I was born in California in Oakland and I uh, grew up in California. I'm, I'm multi-generational Californian as well. So just as Californian as you can be. And um, I, um, you know, my home wasn't a horrible place, but I didn't want to be around my dad. He was unpredictable, dangerous. And so I spent a lot of time outside of the house, which actually kind of served my professional purposes. I didn't realize this at the time, but that was one of the early successes was getting out of the house, doing things, becoming independent, self-sufficient, and those kind of things. There's a lot of problems within that because I have a healthy, still to this day, I have a healthy uh, appetite for rejecting authority. But I've kind of calmed myself over the years, <laughs> but you need a lot of these things to be a spy. You need to be not afraid to leave your hometown and go to other places. And, you know, you can be anybody, not, you can be yourself in other towns when you're growing up, you know, you grew up with other kids, like you're the awkward kid from third grade, fifth grade, whatever it is. It's hard mm -hmm. to shake that. Right. But you go to another town, you can also just be yourself. And I did that a lot too. So yeah, I would go, I would go find girls to date in other towns and, I played basketball and I was just always on the go. And I think those those early moments where I realized it was okay to be out and about in other areas. When you're a kid, if you're 10 miles from home, you know, that's mm -hmm. a substantial difference. And so I met a lot of different folks that way. And right. it taught me and how to be able to be a good guest. Yes. And I would imagine in your spy business that uh, you would have experience taking on different identities. Yeah, I I mean, yes, that is a, a potential skill set and a benefit. I think more importantly for me, I was able to be me and be mm -hmm. honest about who I was in different settings. Because I personally, how I do my spying stuff is I'm always the same dude. I'm Pete, the guy from California. Uh, I might put on like, hey, I, I like to call myself Johnny Goodtime. Like if you see me, you're going to mm -hmm. want to talk to me because I, who's that interesting guy? Right? I have to do some of that because that's part of, of the thing. But the guy you're talking to is just an elevated version of me. Uh, so I'm excited because I want you guys to feel like I'm happy to be there. I'm happy to be your guest. I'm happy to talk to you about the things that you're fascinated by. Mm -hmm. That's really the only kind of, uh, I wouldn't even call it an act. I would just say that is that. But I learned that by being a kid, going to people's houses, like, hey, stay with us for dinner and we'll take you home later on, you know, kind of thing. And so yeah. all of those things founded who I was as a collector. 
Yeah, well, it's your persona and you're very outgoing and uh, I'm sure that uh, that would help with your line of work. Uh, how old were you, uh, Pete, when you actually joined the Army? I was 24. I had already graduated college. I couldn't find a good job. And I had that dilemma of I don't have enough experience to get a job, but I can't get a job to have experience. And so I was pushing carts in the rain at Costco. And I was like, I have got to do something different. I see, can't seem to crack this code. I don't mind pushing carts. I love pushing carts, but that's not what I went to college for. And so I'm like, I have to make a change before I wake up 10 years, you know, thinking I have to make a change. And so I went from yeah. never considering the military to being in it in a month. In a month. <laughs> Oh my gosh. Well, we're going to hear about that after our break. And our break is for if you are a whiner or if you know a whiner, this is for you. Lately, there's a whining epidemic in our world. People are even whining about whining. Are you sick and tired of listening to everyone whining all the time? So was January Jones, the author of Thou Shall Not Whine the 11th commandment that reached number one at amazon.com miss jones based her book on a survey of the top 10 things that people whine about at all ages and all stages of life january is a success coach that can tell you how to help others when you buy thou shalt not whine the 11th commandment you'll find out what people whine about and how to stop them from whining this is the perfect gift book to give or get for any occasion Thou Shall Not Wine was voted the best gift to be given anonymously for those special people in your life. Ms. Jones is an internationally known author in the style of Irma Bombeck, specializing in housewife humor with her book being published in Korea and China. You can find Thou Shall Not Wine at Amazon.com. Welcome back with my guest, Peter who is not a whiner because he is a winner. <laughs> now tell us, you were 24 and with yeah. one month you decided to go to, what did you have a revelation or some kind of a experience? No, it was it was just that, you know, I was pushing carts in the rain. I have a college degree and I, I tried, to, I was trying to get into TV as a sportscaster and I worked really hard to do this. And, and uh, back, you know, back this is the nineties in the early nineties and, the way you did it was you set your tape off and I was willing to start somewhere small and move up and be broke for a while. I was willing to do all that, but I, I, I couldn't even get that. I was at the you know the lowest market, Bozeman, Montana. And they're like, yeah, no thanks. And I'm like, to, to carry cables in Bozeman, I'm not good enough for that. Oh well, <laughs> all right. You know, it's, um, it's a revelation when you're like, okay, I've got to do something. I've got to do something else. And, and uh, I was sort of just treading water, but yeah. Yeah, you know, I it's just amazing that you said Bozeman because I have friends, uh, Paul and Nancy Kane, and they were both born there, and they are Montana just to the core, and I think they even have a summer home there now. Most people have not had the experience of going to Montana. I was fortunate to go there, and it's beautiful. But there's really, unless you're a hunter, there's really not much to do, is there? Yeah, and I'm not knocking Bozeman. I have my, my a lot of my my aunt lives in Missoula, and so I had connections. I had connections to the TV industry, and again, no job was there to be found. And it wasn't that I sucked. It's just you know there were only so many jobs to go around. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, so I was ready to go to Bozeman though, and like that's not where I'm from. That's you know way off. Like not it's not even close to Missoula. But I was willing to go there to start my career, but I, there was no career to be had. Oh, okay. And so uh, you enlisted. You weren't drafted. You They didn't draft in the 90s. Right. Listed in the Army. And uh, where did you train? It was a place called Fort Huachuca. And it's uh, it's oh. sort of the spy school for the Army. And uh, the, the United States military sends a lot of people there in general. So I went there for my, my counterintelligence training. And that was about, I don't know, like that's that's like a it's a little more than four months. And in that four months, you're busy learning all of the very, very basic things of how to be a counterintelligence agent. So that's that's where I started all of the the official counterintelligence stuff. Mm -hmm. Four months. Wow, what an experience. Um, okay, and you, I can't believe they could teach you all of that in four months. It must have been really intense, wasn't it? 
I, it was, you know, I was so new and so foreign to the military, everything for me, like how to, the, all the acronyms and all of the other yeah. words that I went, went into the education center one time and it was called the RASCON Center. And I asked the lady, what does RASCON stand for? I pointed on the wall to a dude, his last name is RASCON. And I'm like, oh, like that's how, like, like everything was a new, it was a whole new world. So uh -huh. I had to, um, I had to learn a lot. And so it was more about, inculcating and learning um, how to be in the military. You got to keep in mind too, I am uh, a type A personality when it comes to professions. And so I am going to find the things that you have to do well, and I'm going to push hard on those things, mm -hmm. which in the military, if you stand out, if you are faster, if you're stronger, if you shoot straighter, if you know more of the regulations, that kind of thing, um, it makes you a bit of a target for the people and they get a little jealous of your hard work and results. So that is that was the biggest lesson I had to learn was how to be in the army and and not be so damned aggressive when I'm just a person who likes to compete and uh, I'm cocky about it and that, you know this is the younger version of me but yeah so the biggest <laughs> thing for me was not so much the training because the, the training is pretty mundane it's a lot of boilerplate and writing and learning regulations and stuff but the other stuff later on when I was self studying my way into these things and mm -hmm. uh, not having to the relationships that I needed to create within the army so that I didn't harm my aggressiveness and eagerness was uh, seen as a trait instead of how it was seen was as like, Hey, Pete's a jerk, you know, because he's running around and kicking everybody's ass and bragging about it. Oh, okay. Okay. So you had to kind of tone it down and rein it in a little bit uh, out of curiosity. Were you married then or were you single? Single, single. Yeah. I would think that would be a real big uh, pre-request uh, of any of the counterintelligence agents. I think not, ha not having a family to deal with would be a big plus, isn't it? Yeah, it's hard on a family. You know, when people yeah. thank me for my service, I think about my daughter, you know, and, and um, it, look, I love my daughter and I know my daughter well, but I don't have the relationship with her that anybody who grew up and raised their kid face to face every day. I don't have that with my daughter. And so in a lot of ways, I'm still getting to know how to be your dad, you know, mm -hmm. because I've been gone for a long time. So when people thank me, I think about her and the yeah. sacrifice we have made in our relationship. And we get along great, but you know, it's just um we don't have that uh thing that I would imagine a regular parent and daughter would have if I had been able to be around more. Oh, for sure. For yeah, you miss a lot. And uh, our generation, our husbands went to Vietnam. And at that time, they were gone for an entire year uh, for one tour. And if they did more tours, they were really gone a lot. Very hard on a family. Let's uh, now, okay, you graduate, you're a counterintelligence spy. Uh, were you allowed to tell your family what you were doing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because we, you know, I say spy because that's ultimately what I was, right? But at the time, you have all of like the lingo that you say. So I'm a counterintelligence agent. I, I collect information, you know. Okay. But um, the reality is, is I'm going out and, and trying to find out things that I'm supposed to, find, supposed to find out. And if the enemy was to catch me, you know what they would call me? They'd call me a spy. So, uh -huh. I, you know, I could tell people what I was doing for the most part. Most everybody, this is the funny part, January, is most people don't believe me. So I'll say, oh, yeah, I was a spy in the army. They're like, you know, whatever, you can't say that. I'm like, I just did. I just did it. <laughs> they never believed me. Yeah, you were more, I would say, say overt versus covert. And so that yeah. would be uh, a big difference uh, in Huge. the work you would be doing. So, okay, so you are then, your family knows about it in a, probably a general sort of way, but not too many details. Where were you sent? What was your first assignment? What was that like? I went to Germany. And so in Germany, it was sort of like the leftovers of the Cold War area, era. Um, you know, like World War II put us there. Cold War kind of divided out where we did things. And counterintelligence people have a mission when they're in garrison, when they're home in Germany. And so I fell in on that mission and started just learning what I needed to learn. Um, I, they put me in operations. And so I was at the headquarters of our little counterintelligence company. And mm -hmm. so I just was available to do whatever was needed, which a lot of times, honestly, was uh, was chores, you know, trim the <laughs> hedges, go clean up this, take all this junk to the dump, a lot of that kind of stuff. 
But my yeah. peers were out in field offices. They were wearing suits. They were using their badges. They were doing investigations. They were doing clearance investigations. So they were doing a lot of things there. And uh, and again, here's me chomping at the bit. I'm like, I'm not here to be cutting hedges. I'm here to dominate. How do I dominate? And mm -hmm. you, know, so you got to imagine you got this thoroughbred bounding around in the paddock, like, what, what, what can I do? And and they didn't know what to make of me, you know. Right. So uh, sure. yeah. yeah. Um, okay, so you were in Germany uh, cutting hedges, <laughs> and then yeah. when did it start getting exciting? Well, you know, when we do our training, it is exciting and it is fun. And so when we would go to the field, they call this a tactical unit. So we are part strategic, part tactical. So we would tactically deploy to the practice area, our lanes where we would work. But mm -hmm. we would do strategic work. So we'd be in our green uniforms running around, hup, 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 kind of faking it because because the truth is, is counterintelligence agents uh, aren't all that like hardcore. You know, we don't like to be dirty and that kind of thing. Right. Um, then... Uh, you'd wipe off the uh, paint if you'd put any on your face or whatever, and you'd put on some civilian clothes, and then you would drive into a town. The town was a Schaffenberg, and so we would go and do um, operations where we would do like meets and surveillance training and counter surveillance training and stuff like that. So during the day, what I because I was in operations, I ended up being a role player. So my time in operations sucked for me because um, of what I wanted to do the job, but when I went into the field, I had all of these pros who had done this job for a long time and they would come to meet me, Pete, the mayor from Aschaffenburg. And so I'd be in a, a little cafe drinking my, drinking my hot chocolate all day. Hello, yes, I'm Pete, <laughs> the mayor of Aschaffenburg. And yeah. I would watch and I would learn from them how they were running sources. And I kind of gathered all of their, their tricks and their trades and we would do a debrief afterwards and I would ask them questions, they would ask me. And I, I learned so much by having all of these repetitions that my peers didn't get because they got maybe one or two meets. I got a hundred of them. Uh, okay, so you uh, you weren't just dipping your toe. <laughs> you were jumping <laughs> right into the action. Yeah. 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 And, and, sure. Okay, so we're going to take another break. But when we come back, I want you to tell the story uh, about how the Taliban requested a meeting and asked for you by name. Yes. All right, let's do it. <laughs> Let me ask you a question. Are you still wondering who killed Kennedy? Over 50 years later, the assassination is still a mystery. It is unfinished business for our country. Now, get ready for a theory that you've never heard before but will make more sense than any other conspiracy theory that you've ever heard in the past. January Jones speaks the unspeakable in her book, Jackie, Ari, and Jack, The Tragic Love Triangle, connecting Jackie and Aristotle Onassis romantically prior to JFK's assassination. Did you know that Ari was Jackie's guest in the White House during the JFK funeral? He was the only non-family member who was invited by Jackie to stay there during the funeral. Aristotle Onassis was one of the wealthiest men in the world, with the means, the motive, and the money to order an assassination that was the perfect crime of the last century. Ari needed class, and Jackie needed cash. They were perfect for each other. Now, what is Camelot? It is but another tragic love triangle. Jackie, Ari, and Jack is available at JanuaryJones.com, Amazon.com, and audiobooks.com, read by Ms. Jones. Welcome back with Pete Turner. Uh, by the way, Pete, you were in California, so you didn't go back to settle in Bozeman or Missoula, did you? <laughs> no, 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 no. Yeah, I went back to California, and then and then I joined the Army from Oakland. This is where oh, okay. I, I left and started serving, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So then uh, after uh, Germany, uh, I would assume your next assignment might have been Afghanistan? Well, we went to Bosnia during my German okay. time as part of the Dayton Peace Accords that were designed to hold that Bosnian-Serbian peace. Um, so that was that during my time in Germany. So I, I was there for two years and uh, half of that time-ish. I spent over in the um, in the area for for Bosnia, and that was neat because I got to actually do my job and uh -huh. and leave the the camp every day to go determine 
you know, how the, the peace was holding. And it's a very unique time in, in, in military history where the spies were the, were the tip of the spear. It was our job to go out and find out what, you know, because that's not infantry people, that's not tanks. They had, they had no fight at all. It was us that we had to go out and determine these things. And it was really, it was a time for me to really get, just you talk about diving in deep, that's diving in deep right there because we didn't know how dangerous it was going to be. So I got a chance to do spy work every single day. Oh, how exciting. Um, first, before we talk about uh, uh, Saddam and uh, the Taliban, did you, when it came to interpreters, did you get to, how did they match you up? Could you choose who you wanted or were you assigned or how did they even uh, interview for jobs? You know, I, I, don't, I don't know how that process works. I do know that I had to use interpreters and they would provide us with them. And for the most part, I tried to use the person I was given because there's, there's a finite amount of them. And I looked at it as my job to teach my interpreter how we were going to work together. And I got better and better and better and better at this as I got more experienced. And we just actually had a show yesterday and we were talking quite a bit about interpreters because mm -hmm. how we treat them usually is pretty negative. And so I'm like, I'm not going to do that. This person and I have to go do very dangerous work. I need them to trust me that I'm looking out for them. And, and I need them to speak in a way that allows them to get the information that we need. And so my question may not be the right question. And they know culturally what direction to go and how to, how to navigate that conversation. And so mm -hmm. I focused early on on developing my relationship with my interpreters and being fierce on their side because frankly, Americans, first off, we call them Terps. They don't like that. Call them John, call them Dave, call them interpreters, but don't don't just minimize them to just the word Terp and then look down on them. And so I, I spent a lot of time with those guys trying to understand what it was like to be them. And so I can improve their condition with me and make it so that even though we worked hard constantly and it was dangerous, that they um, knew that I had respect for them and wouldn't let anybody else mess with them. And uh, did some of those relationships continue after you left the army? Yeah, yeah. I, I, there are a number of interpreters that I still talk to to this day. Absolutely. Oh, that's wonderful. Okay. Now, uh, so where were you? What country were you in when the uh, Taliban requested to speak to you by name, which would terrify me? So <laughs> I want to hear about yeah. that. Yeah. <laughs> First off, I didn't know that this was going to happen. And I was in Afghanistan and I was in a little village way off the main route. So we were way out in the middle of nowhere. I was on a little army outpost, but, um, and our outpost had a, had a, like a security bubble of, let's say, 300 yards. Any, anything inside of that, no one was going to get too crazy uh, because they, they would lose that fight. But as soon mm -hmm. as you got more than about a quarter mile away, things got different, right? And, and there was a lot less security and safety. We still went out every day, yeah. but. That's so this is a very we had to provision through airdrops, you know, so airplanes would fly over, you know, once a week and drop stuff down into us. That's how remote we were. So mm -hmm. um, we're working with this local governor in this this far flung district. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, we'd made a lot of strides during the winter, like while they while the Taliban bed down, we were working hard, working hard, working hard and developing influence. And so one of the days, my buddy Rich and I, we were working and the governor said, hey, I want you guys to go down. Uh, with me tomorrow night and go to, we'll just say the name Dave. We're going to go to Dave's house, Dave the farmer. Dave's obviously an Afghan, but in this case, let's keep it Dave. Okay. So we're going to go to Dave's house and uh, meet a bunch of farmers and uh, do the standard conversation thing that we always do. Like, oh, that's great. We'd love to do it. We had no idea that this was in any way a setup at all. So um, the next day we walk off the camp, we walk past the government center. We're walking closer and closer to the edge of our control, right? That doesn't mean that army wasn't watching and looking out for us, but we didn't know there'd be any more on alert. So they just knew that we were going a couple, and really it's a couple houses away. They're farmhouses, so there's some distance, but yeah. you sit down, have this meeting, talking to all these farmers, and we just do what we normally do. And again, we're overt, and so I'm not hiding what I'm doing. I'm being honest about it. I'm here yeah. to help. I to understand you guys. I want to get the Americans so that they understand, you, you know, all these things that I do. And uh, the meeting was over, and Rich and I walked home. <laughs> no big and then the next day, the governor, you know, we go down to see him and he's like, hey, I've got to tell you guys something. Um, that meeting yesterday at Dave's house, well, the Taliban set that up and they wanted to assess you guys and decide what they were going to do. And I'm like, Jesus Christ. He's like, yeah, I had no say 
in this other than just to set it up because that's what was required. And uh -huh. is that the is they like you and Rich. They see that you respect Afghan ways, that you're not trying to change us, and that you um, you know, were men of, of letters, educated, and so they highly respected that. And uh, they gave us license to operate in that area. And, you know, and ultimately that's good. That's a mark that the, word, the way I approach this works because I'm not trying to, I am trying to help people. I'm trying to reduce threat in the area. I am trying to help us build up their government to their benefit. And so, yes, I'm concerned about bombs. Yes, I'm concerned about bad guys. Yes, I want to meet them and make them my friends. But I don't start with that. That's not like I don't walk around town going, where are the bombs? Where are the bad guys? Where are the bombs? Where are the bad guys? Because yeah. you'll never meet those guys that way. Um, wow. That's, uh, I mean, I, if someone, had, they had requested me by name, I would have freaked out because I would have wanted yeah. to know, how did they find my name? How did they know me? But since you were. Oh, over, I, I wanted to know my name. Yeah. Yeah. You were yeah, very. I wanted to know my name. Yeah, you were very accessible to them. That, that's a great story, though. <laughs> and then uh, also, I want you to share with us a little bit about you used a source who uh, was a former uh, assassin working for Saddam Hussein. Now, uh, yeah. you must have had a hell of a good translator for that. I did, I did have a very good translator for that. I do want to say this. I want the enemy to know my name. I'm the mm -hmm. same guy. So the same guy that talks to the colonel is the same guy that talks to the Taliban. And so I love it when the army comes running up from the intelligence shop and like, Pete, Pete, they know your name. They're saying, we've got to find Pete and kill him. And I'm like, yes, this is good. Because it means <laughs> that I'm on the field. Because my job's not allowed to be safe. I, safety is not the thing I get. I have to push myself out and interact mm -hmm. with the enemy in a way that causes them to react to my presence. And if I don't have that, but I'm not done my job. So I want them to know my name. I want them to see me working. And I want them to be like, oh yeah, that dude. Yeah, we know him. Yeah, he's really influential. He has a network of friends. So that's yeah. that's the close the loop on that. The, mm -hmm. um, the, so with that in mind, I'm in Iraq working with my with the, the team I'm on and uh, I don't feel like I know anybody and I'm just there to help and just trying to figure out how to we renew to Iraq and everything. And mm -hmm. we go over to the SEAL camp and we're talking to the SEALs. And one of their chiefs looks at me, he's like, I know you. And I'm like, you don't know me, man. And nobody knows me. He's like, no, I know you. And so we figured out that he had gone to a course that I was an instructor at. It was a, it was a spy course and he had gone. And he's like, you were awesome. You were great. And so here's what we're going to do. We're going to leave and I'm going to give you Johnny Walker. He's an interpreter and he is fantastic. <laughs> we're going to want him back, but we don't want the, we don't want special forces to get him. So you guys use him. He'll be fantastic for you. And so Johnny and my team and I, we all worked and we used Johnny and Johnny introduced us to this assassin. And that guy was just as, um, look, he's a regular person, but his job was horrible. And so if you remember in the, in the departed, uh, Jack Nicholson is shooting people on the beach right at the very beginning of the movie. And he, he laughs how the one lady, when he killed her, how she felt funny. Well, this dude in the rock, he said that to me before the departed. And he, he said, yeah, so I remember one time I was shooting these women and their kids and they would fall and it was just hilarious how they fell. And I'm like, this is a cold, cold person to laugh yeah. about the people killed. But you got to meet nasty, evil people to prevent nasty, evil things from happening. And you got to turn them into your friends. And so mm -hmm. that's, again, like I'm not afforded safety in my job. I have to go meet these people. I have to tolerate them because if I don't, well, then they're left to their own devices. At least then I'm negotiating with this person. I'm trying to calm them down. I'm trying to access their network so that mm -hmm. hopefully I can do my job. Just out of curiosity, you said Johnny Walker. Do they give the name, all these names, are they all names of liquors? <laughs> no, it just, he liked to drink. That was his persona. And so they gave him a name. You know, all the interpreters have some kind of name to protect them. And so like yeah. I've worked with a guy named Cheetah, a guy named Jaguar, a guy named Ford, oh, a guy okay. named uh, Night Train. Night Train could be booze, but he wasn't called that because of that. He it was okay. more about his uh, lifestyle. Yeah, yeah. It's the, uh, that's the military way of doing it. It's your call name. Uh, we're now retired many, many years, and we're in a group called the uh, DAV, D Disabled American Veterans, and we meet all yep. through the year and month and do things together, and they all have call names, you know, so, <laughs> and that's 
what they go by. They don't use their real name. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm kind of used to it. <laughs> Um, we're going to take a break and tell you about some priceless personalities who have been here with me on the show. Have you ever met someone who was unforgettable? Someone who has touched your heart and soul? People who have faced difficult problems? People who have struggled to find solutions? People who fearlessly shared their stories? People who have not only informed you, but inspired you. People who have priceless personalities. I have been fortunate to host an internet radio talk show called January Jones Sharing Success Stories. And it has been my privilege to interview hundreds of guests. My guests have shared their stories, their struggles, their secrets, and their successes in their own words. In this book, we're talking about people dealing with problems such as incest, molestation, runaway kids, child abuse, drug abuse, polygamy, unemployment, scandal, and starting over. Then there are my guests dealing with difficult physical struggles such as blindness, cancer, and birth defects that are beyond traumatic. My guests have all been exciting, eclectic, and energizing. They have amazed, amused, and even astonished me. I have adored getting to meet them, and I adore sharing them with you. Attention all listeners, Priceless Personalities, Success Stories Shared by January Jones, Volume 2 is now available at Amazon.com in paperback and Kindle editions. You'll be able to meet 10 amazing people who will be sharing their own personal stories with all their struggles, successes, and solutions sprinkled with lots of humor and hope. Priceless Personalities features a teenager who becomes one of the famous Supremes from Motown, a nurse who has a humorist helps people to heal an inspiring laughter yoga instructor a mother dealing with the loss of a child an incredible motivational speaker a woman who married five times a gifted paranormal nurse a wise economist a funny female humorist along with an older man sharing his sweet childhood in the deep south January's guests are all amazing and amusing. You will never forget meeting them. Go to Amazon.com for your own priceless experience. Welcome back with the priceless personality visiting us today, Pete Turner. Aww. Pete, just before we close out, I love having you here and I enjoy talking to you so much. But let's talk about the International Institute for Nonproliferation Studies. That's a long title. <laughs> by I, I, yes, which I could say a lot faster. Um, what, it's a, what it is is a think tank, right? And why yeah. is it different? So I'm gonna. Here's the thing. The first thing I did was I changed the damn name of that place. So uh, it's the Ground Truth Center. <laughs> we got a lot more simple. Yeah, okay. so we still want to worry about non-proliferation of nuclear weapons, which apparently is still a thing. And we, we still for sure want to focus on reducing the amount of corruption that we cause mm -hmm. and, and how it impacts us. But really what we're talking about is, is linking the ground truth people, people like me, people who have to go out and, and be the point of contact for U.S. foreign policy or any kind of national policy, whether it's education or health or whatever it is. And people like me who go out and they're like, ah, what you guys think is going to happen and what I'm able to accomplish here, these are not the same thing. And so I'm trying to close that gap between the academic theory, between the legislator, uh, the diplomat, all of the people who are making these um, choices, answering these questions. How do we improve something? And the actual mechanic at the bottom who's like going to be like, hey, um, your idea is ador adorable, but around here, that never going to work. Here is what I can right? And so hopefully that communicative path, if I can link it, we can make better decisions and have better expectations and more properly train that mechanic to go out and do things because it's it's more closely tied to reality. That's what the goal of the Ground Truth Center is. And with that comes smaller, um, less uh, less ideologically based, like what's practically, what, what can we do practical today to make the, the strategic goal, get fed a little win, a little win after a little win after a little win, as opposed to let's go spend $120 million on building this building and then yeah. have nothing come of it. You know, that's so wasteful. Let's, let's reduce that. Okay. And um, th is this like, do you meet in a, a place or is it all done 
on the internet or how do you, how many people participate and how do you come up with policies? Yeah. So I don't want to come up with policies. I want to help people that are trying to come up with policies. So like if we're going to deal with homelessness, I want the governor to call me and say, Pete, uh, we want to deal with homelessness. We know that case management is a vital piece of this. We want to make sure that we have a relevant solution or a policy that's going to include you know, it's like when you have um, stakeholders, right? You know, like, yeah. okay, we're having a stakeholder meeting. And I'm like, where are the customers, you know, yeah. or where are the Iraqis? Like we're making these decisions. Where are the people who have to bear the brunt of that decision? And and that is what we're trying to do. So it's think tinky in nature, but more I'm trying to be um, a consult consultative approach to trying to improve our decision making so that when we provision things, that it's, it's a little more accurate. I'm not, I'm not saying anything bad about anybody in this whole process. Everybody's trying their best. Everybody's trying to solve big, complicated problems. But what I've seen from my own firsthand experience is that we aren't any good at it because we have no idea. I call it the space, the spaceship, right? If no one ever leaves the spaceship and they're trying to decide how someone should farm on the ground, that's impossible. You can't do that. So you need yeah. people that can talk to the farmers to help the spaceship say, oh, oh, this is how we help the farmer. I, I would help the farmers all the time. I would do this all of the time, Jerry, whereas I go out and I would say, what's the smallest thing we could do today? Like we, we want you to hire um, foreign labor to bring your crop in. And then the Iraqi farmer would laugh in my face. I write down on my book, laughed in my face. And then he would say, <laughs> there's no amount of crop that my family can't bring in. It's impossible. I will always have another cousin. I will never hire an outsider. And I'm like, okay, now whether that changes, that's not up to me. But what I can tell the spaceship is, hey, they will never hire um, migrant workers to, to bring yeah. in a crop. That's not a thing around here. You know, so yeah. that's sort of the idea is to shrink that gap between the policy and the practitioner. Yeah. And to find out what's really going on on the ground that the other yeah. people are probably, as you said, they're in spaceships, they're too remote. Uh, before we close out, uh, share your thoughts on what's going on in the world now with the uh, the two wars that our country's dealing with. Uh, what thoughts do you have on those? You know, it's, anyone who's standing to probably doesn't know enough. We all have our things that we want to have happen. And, uh -huh. We have our bets, but ultimately we just don't know. I mean, Russia um, is not going to stop and Ukraine is not going to want them to not, they're not going to stop. And so we have to figure out how do we get this war to stop? Because war is horrible. And what we often lose track of is, is that there are people that are dying every day. They're mm -hmm. primarily men dying in both countries. And that means women are going to be subjugated and, and put in a horrible situation. So it's not just the death, it's the next 20 years of what mm -hmm. happens to these people as they try to dig out of a hole and that makes to me like the bigger thing is just the the inhumanity in our, our policies and our approach to things it's terrible that this war has gone on this long and um there's people using the the theories and and the policies to try to exact a a, a win but it's at the cost of a lot of expense a lot of human lives so i, I would say ultimately the, the russia conflict ends at some point hopefully this year i'm hoping and that America and Russia will sit down and they'll negotiate some kind of deal and some piece of Ukraine will probably break off and go to Russia, as I think the most likely scenario today. And I hope it's not a bigger piece because Russia is still trying to push in. And, um, you know, we, we're Americans. We've seen hundreds of millions of dollars, trillions of dollars in the last 25 years go out to no effect. And so I think people are sick of that. So I don't know that a whole lot of Congress people are like, hey, I really want to send $500 billion to Ukraine, you know, followed by the reconstruction. Oh my God. You know, yeah. so yeah. I don't know what's going to happen, but it's contentious as hell. And it is the Israel Hamas fight. Yeah. I think the best person to look at for, for guidance on this is a guy named John Spencer. He's a friend of mine and he focuses on urban warfare. And a lot of the narratives that come out of that fight are inaccurate. And uh, they don't paint an even picture. If you find yourself hard on one side or the other of this fight, you're probably not dealing in reality, I would say. It's uh -huh. tough to say that. But the reality is, is this is war. War involves a lot of people dying. And neither side wants to quit. So, like, I always say the fastest way to get to peace in this fight is for Hamas to say, we surrender. Here are all, the, all of the, uh, the kidnapped people that we have. 
Mm -hmm. They're not going to do that. They haven't had the will knocked out of them yet, right? And Israel certainly isn't going to stop. And so when we talk about all these other things, like that is the crux of this. Hamas started this particular war. They did it as as gruesomely and as horribly as possible. And so the only way for it to stop is for Israel to either beat all of the fight out of Hamas or Hamas to say, okay, um, we're done getting all of these negative things. But you don't see either side wanting to do that because they still got a lot of fight in them. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's just, uh, it's uh, it's like the uh, proverbial impossible thing to, to solve. There's no, it's, there's no right and wrong. And I can, I think most people can see that there's two sides. Maybe not so much uh, with Russia, but in the Middle East, there's definitely two sides and they both are fighting so hard. It's just a, a very sad, sad situation. Uh, on the lighter side, I'm going to ask you a question. Oh, good. I ask all my guests before we sign off. Yeah. And if you could invite someone to dinner besides me, living or dead, who would you like to have dinner with? Uh, you know what? I, I never got to face-to-face meet my grandfather. I've learned a lot about him. I've actually got a pile of his letters right here from World War II. Oh, my and God. I, I'm slowly putting his story together. Um, so it would be great to have that conversation with him. I think we would have a because because of my unique experience in war. Um, mm-hmm. You know, no one in my family has as much war experience as I do. So when I get a chance to talk to him, they always have all these questions, and he is the one person that has a significant amount. And so it'd be great to talk to him. Oh yeah, yeah. Well, that that's a great question. I mean, great answer because everyone oh, thanks. speaking famous people. <laughs> yeah. But that's yeah. a very that's a very personal, special uh, answer. And thank you for sharing that with us. And thank you so much for coming on the show, the podcast with me today. I've enjoyed having you. And I think we've learned a little bit from you. And uh, I hope you'll come back again. Anytime. Oh, wonderful. Okay, dear listeners, I hope you've enjoyed our time together today. We tried to be in, very informative Evan, inspiring today. My upcoming guests will all be eclectic, exciting, and energizing, just the way Pete was today. So much fun. Now my 80-year-old thought for the day, enjoy, enjoy, enjoy. It may be later than you think, or it may be now or never, my dear friends. (laughs) So for now, thank you for entering the No Wine Zone and share our stories and our show with everyone you know. Remember, you need to stop whining right now and then start smiling the way Pete does. And if that doesn't work, then you can just go out and eat chocolate, lots and lots. Pleasure signing off from the Glitter Granny. Take care and stay safe until we meet again. Bye-bye. We want to thank you for listening to January Jones Sharing Success Stories. Always remember Ms. Jones' personal mantra, if you can think it, you can do it. That's what all of our guests have done with their lives, and so can you. You are the ultimate success coach in your own life. All you need to do will be to start sharing your own story with your family and friends. We hope that our guest stories will encourage you to explore an equation in your future that will combine your creativity, plus connecting with others will enable you to be successful too. Always remember, your passion plus your purpose will equal prosperity as you explore the wonderful world of January Jones.